thank you for the welcome and and it's always a pleasure to come back to Ireland. I'm based in Liverpool now and I'd just like to say thank you to the Royal Irish Academy for funding our project and being patient with us as we uh, go through the years. I'm presenting today, I want to um, put the names of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Ruth Carden and Dr. Helen Lewis, who are intimately involved in this project. And I just would like to just show these two pictures to start with. These are two caves that I'm going to be talking about. On the left is Castle Pook Cave, and on the right is Kilcolman Cave. And um, obviously we're taking these photographs from the wider landscape. But the point I want to see is that these are limes, low-lying limestone knolls. So there's the kind of raised knolls in the landscape. And these pictures kind of show that well. So the cave itself is to the right of the lime kiln here in this picture. So I'd like to talk a little bit about our research and then a bit about the geological context of these two caves that I'm going to focus on today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the excavations that took place in them in the early 20th century. And then I'm going to introduce the fieldwork that we've been doing last year and this year at these two caves. And also, um, we're delighted to say we've been funded again for next year. So I would like to let, it, let you know what we'll be up to next year as well. So what motivates myself and my colleagues is this question about the Paleolithic of Ireland. So I've been working with uh, Cody and School for many years. And indeed, in 2019, I presented here about a cave called Bally the Mintra Cave in County Waterford, if any of you remember that presentation. So what we're looking at is understanding when people were first in Ireland and why is the Paleolithic, has it been so elusive and the, the evidence is so rare. I mean, at the moment, we have from Alison Gwendolyn Cave on the bottom left there, you see the patella with clear incision lines on it, indicating that this bone had cut marks on it from the Younger Dryas period. So the two caves in particular we're focusing on are really important for addressing these questions. And I'm going to say a little bit about that in a second. But I just want to show you these maps are showing you some climate models, some ice sheet models. The latest one is in the, the, the dark blue color up the top there. They're from 20,000 uh, 2022 from Clark et al. And this is showing you that around 23,000 years ago, the whole of Ireland was covered by an ice sheet. So that's kind of the last glacial maximum period. So were people in Ireland before that period, during or after that period, the questions that we're, we're looking at. And um, we also have to focus on the idea of land bridges and when was Ireland accessible. But clearly the fauna has made it to Ireland, so the question is, where are the, the people? So the reason we are moving to Castle Pook, and we've just had a temporary pause on Valley de Mintra, because that cave has been, um, every time we dig there, it gets bigger and bigger what we're dealing with there. But we decided to focus over on uh, Castle Pook because Ruth is uh, our bone specialist at Valley de Mintra, and she said to us, look, Richard, we've, uh, you know, I found evidence of, of reindeer bones with human modifications on them. So here's an example of one of them. On the, on, the, on the right over here. And obviously we have a cave that we have evidence was clear evidence that people were in or in the vicinity in the past. So we've switched our attention to understanding more about this particular cave. So in the meantime, in the background, work is going on on these, uh, these samples with, with reindeer with cut marks and dating is going on. And we have to provide some important context from the archaeological perspective and to try and understand, can we find any more evidence from these caves? So the geological setting of Castle Buch and Kilcolman, these two caves are around two kilometers apart. And as you can see here, they're in, they're in North Cork, not far from Donnerail, uh, which is not far from Mallow, for those of you who know the area. And they're part of a, of a wider catchment system of the Blackwater River Valley, where Peter Woodman had been doing many uh, sort of much research in the past. And the Blackwater River Valley runs out and discharges at Yule. But up the upper reaches, there's a valley called the uh, Orbeg Valley. And in this particular valley is where the caves are located. And geologically speaking, caves are often obviously found in limestone environments. 
And this particular map from the OSI shows you three different limestone bands in those different colors. And the one with the caves around, the pinkish one, is the kind of more permeable limestone. These are all carboniferous in age, hundreds of millions of years old, the age of the rocks. And in contrast, you've also got the red sandstone, the old red sandstone there, the Devonian rocks, which form the hills in the region. So that's our kind of context. Richard Usher was the person who excavated in both of these caves. He started off at Kilcolman Cave in 1904. And while he was digging there, he was also obviously involved in Castle Poot Cave because he was called over to Castle Poot Cave because of some interesting discoveries, particularly of mammoth bones. So uh, Richard Usher switched his attention from Kilcolman to Castle Pook. And he then continued to work there for around seven, uh, seven years or more, almost 10 years, until uh, his, his death in 1973, or 1913. And it wasn't an untimely death in the sense that he was actually 73 when he passed, which means he was 64 when he decided to go and investigate Castle Poot Cave in these caves. He was obviously a very passionate and active person. And another naturalist, Robert Schaaf, was took the job of writing up his results because he obviously hadn't written up his results. And there's a main paper published in the Proceedings of Royal Irish Academy. So uh, perhaps Robert spoke here 100 years ago or so in the past talking about these caves, as did Richard. So they did a map of the cave, of their system, and it looks a bit like a rabbit warren. And on his first entry into the cave, uh, Richard Usher got lost in the cave for an hour. And it's that sort of cave. It is very much, if you turn left, and if you don't know where you've gone, then you're in trouble and you could be disappeared. Some teenagers went down there years ago and couldn't get out for ages. And you know, they hear these kind of anecdotal stories. So it's a tricky cave system. So it's a cave system that's kind of fractured and water passes through it to form these, these passages, these narrow, narrow passages, some of them. And Richard Usher gave them all names, the, the kind of open galleries. And here's some of the gallery names, the entrance hall, Hain Hall, Elephant Hall. So quite descriptive names, and some of them are a little banal, third gallery, fourth gallery. But you can see that what's characteristic of them is they have sand in them, and they have stalagmitic layers, and then sand again, sometimes stalagmitic layers. And it's in the sand deposits that the bones are found. And these bones weren't brought in by the sand. It's thought that the sand had formed in there, and then the bones were brought in. This is Michael Sims's theory, who works with this. The bones came in, and then the stalagmitic floors represent stillness in the environment. So people were, or people, or at least a stick with fauna for the moment, were in this cave in the past. So it wasn't all washed in, flushed in from way across the valley. We think people were or people or fauna were in this cave. So Ruth in a separate project, a coalesce grant with Helen Lewis as the PI is, uh, and myself was involved in this too, is going back and revisiting the, the faunal collections from a hundred years ago and collating them all. And you can see in this particular chart, it shows the, what, is, what is left so far, what she's been calculating. And there's a lot of reindeer bones in the assemblage, as well as other animals, as you said, such as mammoth. 50 years ago, another expedition took place in this cave. So part of the Cork Speleological Group, there's a man called Jerry Ahern 50 years ago, uh, was in this cave, and they discovered there's more to Castle Pook than was excavated by uh, Richard Usher. And by the way, he excavated a lot of the cave sediments out over those nine odd years. So there's a whole new part to the cave system, and this hasn't been excavated by Usher, so we wanted to one of our initial aims was to go back into this area. So we, we contacted, because we knew at this stage we had the bones that we have with, with cut marks, we knew that we need to find out more about the cave. So we contacted um, about Jerry, and, and he still, as part of the Cork Speleological Group, still goes into caves. And there he is last year coming down into the cave, and he was remembering exactly where things were 50 years ago in that cave. So they mapped with Marisha Sullivan. They mapped a lot of the this new part of the the cave system. So we ventured in in 2022. On the top, pick people are on the top are the cavers, and I can only, I can honestly say that we couldn't do this without them. They are like experts in every every right. We have a Land Rover parked on the site 
one of the one of the um, members stand on the top left there is the um, rescue who's someone stuck in a cave somewhere in Ireland. He's called and he drives a jeep. So it's always reassuring to see his jeep parked out the front with um, cave rescue on it. And other expert members, and they all come, they all wear overalls, they're all sensible. Us archaeologists, we don't know how to dress going into caves, but they all just fully kitted out with lights and everything. Like, and they just, we pretend we know what we're doing, but then they turn up and it's like, okay. And they laugh at us as well because we see a little narrow hole and it's like, that's not narrow, you know, get through there, you know, in this kind of way. And it's like, okay. So we venture into this cave and our team, we had to involve, get mapping involved is very important because we wanted to update those maps. So we wanted to look from the outside as well as the inside. And ideally our goal was to try and, or it is to try and have a map where you can effectively walk out on the, on the field above and know exactly where you're standing above what cave passage system beneath. So Pat Randolph Quinney from the University of Northumbria was the expert who's he's worked at Rising Star <coughs> in um, South Africa doing 3D mapping there. He's involved and we got some good 3D mapping done. But more importantly, and just as significantly, the Cork Speleological Group used a Leica Disto to 3D scan the cave using modern technology as well. And that took them a number of months, weekends, volunteering, going down and doing this job. So this is in a, in a working process of, at the moment. This is deep inside the cave. This is Phil Kenny, who's probably the most experienced cave archeologist in Ireland at the moment. And Phil's on the phone down there, I think, because the cave has put a phone line, cable and lights, and it's 30 minutes to get to this part of the cave. And they'd always like ring and say, we've made it. So we knew that they were okay down there. So we went to this area where Jerry had said they found a, a mammoth tibia, indeed, that we, they did found one and we came to the, the museum here. And we excavated a couple of small sondages to, just to try and get a test ready to see is there any depth of sediment in this part of the cave. So we, we put in two small cuttings. You can imagine after going half an hour down there, bringing out any massive spoil would be like a, a pain in the neck, to say the least. So we were quite targeted down there for the time being. And yeah, the cavers were helping out bringing up you know, little containers, secure containers of, of sediment. So Phil and Kez dug a trench like this in the cave and found some of these sand deposits I mentioned, and they contained, some of them contained fauna in the stratigraphic context, which is very good. And a second area, we found some charcoal, which got us quite excited, because obviously charcoal could mean people in terms of halves or five places. So we targeted this small area here but alas, um, not, no disrespect to the medieval period at all, the date came back as 1190 plus or minus 20. So some fissure above material had fallen into this particular um, area. The other place we looked was at the front of the cave, where the, near the modern entrance is an artificial entrance, which um, the use of the excavations. And we knew when we were going to be looking here that we had to deal with the idea that are we dealing with spoil or are we dealing with archaeology? Because they'd be traipsing in and out tons and tons of material through here. But there was literally, you know, dirt on there. We had to, like, oblige to dig down and, and see what was there. So we did our second excavation just near the entrance here. And we found a quite convincing looking stalagmitic floor layer, which is the white you see here context 104, that that was going across part of this area. Like, you know, we thought we were very careful about this because we we're thinking that it's going to be, um, you know, modern debris, but, you know, it just looked like it was almost like a floor layer. And then beneath that, we saw this lens of charcoal, which you can see there as well. So, and in that charcoal, there was charred hazelnuts. And, you know, you think charred hazelnuts, that sounds quite interesting. We better, like, be careful about this. So we, we got those um, dated and uh, they turned out to be probably the lunch of Richard Usher because they, did, they were modern dates. So, you know, you can never be certain. We, we would have been neglectful of us if we didn't do that effort, but we just had to be sure. So all of what you see there is probably modern, modern um, trapes, trample that's been put into the cave. Nevertheless, in our 2022 season, we we're only about a week digging in the cave and a week surveying. We recorded 140, 154 animal bones. We, we picked some up, we plotted them in where we found them in some of the passages and as well as some of the ones that were 
in the um in the sediment deep in the sand chambers so that's where we left it in 2000 and, and um, 22 and we decided we would we would take a break from doing any more digging in 2023 in Castle Poot because we wanted to get our results back from 2022 our post digs like the dating and stuff so we didn't just want to go digging again until we knew what we were going to be digging so we said look let's go and have a look at Clacolman Cave so we went over there in um, April of this year and that's our team uh, we couldn't have done this dig without any one of them not being involved we had cavers again and archaeologists and some of my students and Clacolman Cave you might know Kilcolman from uh, its links with Edmund Spencer and the Fairy Queen. He wrote the Fairy Queen here, or part of it here. And excavations took place here in the 1990s. And Tygo Keefe wrote a really useful article in 2017 about it all. And basically, from our perspective, they didn't seem to go near the cave. So to the south of the cave, there's a big bog, big nature reserve, so almost a kilometre in diameter. This is like a draining sump for where the water runs off those mountains and runs through and out into the, into the um, lower reaches of this valley. We have a picture from 1934 of the cave and a picture today. And you can see there's a difference in the levels. The chap standing in 1934 versus today. So there's been some significant disturbance in the front of this cave in the, in the 20th century since that photograph was taken. And we think it's probably due to agricultural activity, having talked to the local landowners and so forth, that some activity was taking place in this region in the past. And so a substantial amount of the front there has disappeared in this particular cave system. We mapped it, or at least the Cork Speleological Group, our partners, mapped the cave for the first time. So we have a really nice map of this kind of phreatic tube And then we, we did some excavation. So we just went onto the sides of the, of the um, excavation, the sides of the, that were left from this earlier 20th century excavation that took place there from the, from the farming activity. And here you can see the results of the cleaning up the section. It basically it advanced our excavation here by a number of years. It sped it up basically, because we would have, we're just gonna be putting a two by one trench into what would have turned out to be a kind of limestone shatter at the top and then beneath that, all that orange is sort of fluvio glacial sediments that have washed in during an ice age context, probably the last glacial maximum. And there are even these marks on the sides of the walls called scallop marks. Scallop marks, scalloping is an indication of flow. So Mike Sims was able to say by the size of the scallop marks, he could determine the rate that the water was flowing through the cave carrying these sediments. So we could determine that there was kind of slow to moderate in one area, this is higher up, but when they're, when they're bigger scallop marks, it's a faster rate of, of sediments. But basically this cave was like a funnel taking material, uh, Devonian sandstone material, washed through the cave and down towards Kilcolman Bog. So this wasn't a cave that was conducive for our research. You can see the base of it there going down over four meters deep of, of this deposit. So a substantial amount of material is washed in through here, completely sterile of archeology span and bones. So we called it a day there for the time being. There might be something else somewhere in there, but we called it a day. And just this, this is what you're seeing now is from September of this year. So we went out quite late on the, in, the, in the year, given that we have to have the, the grants all in by October, but we have to go by when the farmers do their crops. So we can't dig it any earlier because it was like they was still had a, he still had a field of, of um, I don't know what was on there. Was it wheat? I'm not sure. He had a crop on there anyway that was only available in September. So it was like, okay, we better get ready for this. And what we wanted to do in September was do some geophysical survey work over the fields above where the cave is because we wanted to try and help locate it. And my colleague from Liverpool John Moore's University, Dr. David Jordan, who you see working desperately hard there on the right. Um, he is seriously working very hard. Um, designed our geophysical survey plan, because I was speaking to him and he said, look, I can come and do this. I can tell you the depth of things. I was going, really? And he said, okay, let's do it then. So our aim was to find some other access into the caves via buried entrances. Presumably some sediment material has fallen in and collapsed 
at some point in the past and maybe we can excavate into these caves from the top rather than trying to go down these half an hour of winding narrow passages. And what's interesting is that back we, we know this because there are parts of the cave where they're called the hyena, hyena land and you know there's mammoth bones in there that are deep inside like there's no way that they came through the same entrance there must have been other entrances to these cave systems. So he used ERT, electrical resistance tomography and ground penetrating radar so we came over for a week and when we started at the start of the year this is our map we had like this is literally that map from 1975 and we kind of plonked it over the top of the of the ground and we're thinking this is probably where it kind of fits you know this kind of way but fortunately the um, Cork Speed Electrical Group came up trumps and have produced now this is the first time we're showing this new map that they produced to the cave and just to get your orientation right we flipped it around the other way so David's turned it around the other way and these little boxes in the different colors represent the areas where he's been doing the, the geophysics or where we did the geophysics. So they were walking for like maybe um, distances of two and a half meters, sometimes less, spacing apart linear lines across the landscape. One of my receipts, I don't know whether you saw this receipt of Anna's there, was for um, knitting needles and thread. And I said to David, look, I've got to submit this to the Royal Irish Academy. It's knitting needles and thread. like." It's, and he said, well, that's perfect. His wife, is a, his wife actually does knitting, but it's like, like as a business. But he says, oh, the perfect thing for, for laying out surveys, for geophysical surveys, is to put the, the knitting needles in and have the, the wool go across. And uh, so they did that. They laid it all out and they did this geophysical survey. And then after that, we had um, Nick Hogan came up from UCC. He's our surveyor. So he was surveying our work at Kilcolman Cave. And he came up during induction week at Cork and he came up and and surveyed in all of these points. So we had an exact location of where the survey took place above ground. So at any point, at any linear point, or any, any linear across there, we can get a, like a vertical profile of going down, like a, like a, like a profile of a, of a section of an archeology span excavation. So we can have this at any particular point. So bear in mind, this is September, so David's done one so far, one's focusing on one, one of these lines. And this is the line you see here. It runs across a cave called, uh, it runs across a gallery called Hall of the Earthquakes and Hall of the Agonies, which I don't know why it's called Hall of the Agonies, I can't remember, but I could say it wasn't the most comfortable place to be. So, but what's really striking about this, you know, you've got to kind of get your eye in and get used to the colors. But if I say to you, if I showed you at the start that limestone, those two kind of knolls I was talking about in the first images, if you bear in mind and think about Kilcolman and that big, the last glacier of Maxim, all that sediment coming through, if you imagine the whole of kind of when we have Ireland being covered by glacial till or diamectin, then there's a quite a contrast between the limestone bedrock and the diamectin. So he's able to, and the till, so he's able to identify that contrast with these techniques, with, with, particularly with the ERT. So when you're seeing the red and the yellows here, and the oranges, that's limestone he's detecting. And this is like one, one section line running across, right? So that's the vertical profile going down. And it, it matches really well with the extent of the cave system. And particularly on the right-hand side, if you see that there's kind of like, um, the blue, if you look at the blue, if you imagine the blue is glacial till, okay? And then the blues and the green is also quite, these are kind of um, basically low resistivity, if you like, um, low resistance, that these blues and the greens, and so they're shooting down, they're getting a signal that's quite deep and coming, up, coming back up. You can see it kind of undercuts in the left there. And so David thinks that that, that is basically a, a, um, that would have been a more of a limestone before the glacial till was deposited. It was like a limestone, more of a limestone kind of face, cliff face, like a rock shelter. And that could be exactly what that is there. That could be one of these new entrances that we've been looking for. Not a new entrance, but an entrance we've been hoping to find, like something where it's going in to the side. And this is kind of what's explained on, on this chart. I should have had this one up when I was speaking about that. So. I think I've summarized all of those particular points there. 
And the GPR, I find it really hard to read the GPR. David looks at this and he tells me a million things. I look at it and I look at it again. But there are particular points where he's highlighted there where there's kind of an alteration in the signal of the GPR and that's detecting voids, that's detecting the cave, the roof, the tops of the cave um, chambers beneath. So that's something which is like, we have these two techniques that are being used at the same time. This is just from last month. I said, David, look, I'm giving a talk next month. And can you like, maybe there's something extra. And um, what he's done here is he's combined Nick Hogan's topographic survey and his results. And now you see that shape of the, the knoll. And now you really see the blue, like this till would have just covered from, from the um, last glacier maximum, has covered over, has buried over this cave system, old entrances, rock shelters potentially. And this comes back to uh, our question about people on an island in the Paleolithic and where do we find the evidence? And that's the same thing again, but just a little bit more, um, a little bit more detailed, the kind of idea of this potential rock shelter there. But what we hope to do next, next year, what we plan to do is look at an area called the Hyena Land by the south, where Schaaf had noted that from Usher, the gallery is rich in bones and has been inhabited by hyenas. And Ruth tells me that hyenas normally go in a couple of meters from the cave entrance, not any further. And then the nearness to the surface was realized when we heard a, a, a mowing machine overhead. And I, you know, I couldn't help but Google about when mechanized machinery came into Ireland to wonder how, you know, how far underground could you hear that? And that was basically, um, there are 70 tractors in Ireland in 1917, apparently. Found that out. So two of the bones with reindeer cut marks come from this area. So we want to target that area very much so. And we want to do some coring and geophysics there to try and find a new way in to find where the context of where these bones that Ruth is finding is coming from. And I'd like to say thank you to all the people who have been involved in helping on this particular project. You can see them up there. Thank you very much.